Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our fourth Architecture Alumni Talk Series webinar. My name is Professor Cameron Brune. I'm the Dean and Head of School here at the University of Queensland School of Architecture. Before we get started this afternoon, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which many of us are meeting today. I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country, and we recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like um, to introduce our presenter for today, Shanine Fanton, and I'll say a little bit about her. Dr. Shanine Fanton is co-director of POD, People Oriented Design, an award-winning multidisciplinary practice committed to sustainability and intercultural design. Shanine has an unusual combination of skills, including architecture, stakeholder engagement, project management, research, and teaching. She's an adjunct associate professor at the University of Queensland and at James Cook University, is a member of the Queensland Urban Design and Places Panel, and the First Nations Advisory Working Group for the Australian Institute of Architects. Shanine undertook her PhD in Arnhem Land in the late 1990s, which focused on the relationship between culture and the design of built environments. Janine has authored seven book chapters and over 30 articles relating to indigenous architecture, intercultural design and tropical architecture and urban design. Um, Janine is a great friend of the school um, and it's wonderful to connect with her through this webinar. Um, Janine, over to you and welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me here today to be able to provide this presentation. Um, it's, a, it's an honour. So um, before I start, I would personally like to acknowledge the Gimoy Wallabro Yurinji people whose land I am speaking to you from today. And I'd like you to take a moment to think about the people's country that you are sitting on today while you're listening to this presentation. Um, certainly for myself personally, the involvement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in my life from the very beginning to now has been very important and um, I continue to try and respect and honour that relationship in the work that we do through POD um, and in my everyday life. So this is where I live. It's 25 kilometres south of Cairns City. The POD office is in Cairns. This is the view from my veranda. I am very lucky to live in this place and this is behind me is a mountain called Mount Peter or Mirungi, and this is near the south boundary of Gimor Wallaburra Yudinji land. Let's see if we can go to the next one. It's not happening for me. Oh, here we go. This is the same view from 1974 of a sugarcane harvest off the front veranda, and this is my family. I am the small one with the trainer pants on. I'm the baby and the youngest, as my siblings remind me. This is where my family has lived since 1927. So I'm telling you that or sharing that with you because it does have a big, big impact um, as a farming family, what your relationship with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are from the region that you live in. So. There's also a series of relationships set up in this photograph that have continued through my life. My older sister is standing next to me um, with the dark hair and the hands on her hips. My eldest brother is hidden in the cane over to the left of the slide as close to our father as possible as part of the farming activity. And my other brother is on a brand new dragster um, in the middle of the photograph. My father is on one of the first harvesting machines in our valley. Um, there's no cab, no air conditioning. And um, this is really a demonstration of him as a man who was willing to try new things to improve his practices. So this is where I'm from. My heritage is um, third generation Italian sugarcane well, farming family. And my grandfather came out from Northern Italy in the 1920s to Australia. On my mother's side, I have a mix, very mixed history of Scottish and English. And I also have um, 
Indigenous step aunts and uncles who are from, who are Waka Waka and were raised in the Bowen Mackay region. Okay, so this is a part of the side of me that some people know about and other people don't. Although I am a kind of, you know, fair, not that fit middle-aged woman, I have a I love a bit of adrenaline and in my spare time, I like to go bushwalking and doing things that challenge me. And so this is an image from last year when my husband and I went canyoning together. Um, and I think some of the things that have made my lifetime of activities interesting is my interest in adventure. I'm pretty adaptable. I'm pretty independent, which is sometimes problematic. I like to improvise and Sufficiency is the last word I used because I guess that works into sustainability and having enough in life. So here's a quick overview of the timeline because today's presentation, I guess, is partly about me, which is I find slightly uncomfortable as I get older, but the other second part of the presentation is about the work. Um, it has been a diverse ride for me through architecture. Um, I was born, as I said, in far north Queensland. I came to the architecture school in the late 80s and then graduated in 1994. I had the minimum time out because that was what was expected of me at the time. I then quickly worked out that I wanted to work in the tropics and um, I had a great time. Well, I had an interesting time at UQ. I was only one of two women who graduated in 1994 out of... Um, that class and the other was Lila Grupp, who's um, partner of Peter Richards at the time. And so it was, a, it was an interesting few years at the end of graduating out of architecture for me. <clears throat> I went to work for Tropo in 1995. You could say I badgered Adrian Welk and Phil Harris to give me a job until they did, um, which is probably another part of my personality. I, I can be quite tenacious. I was only there for a couple of years because my father got very sick in the middle of that work and he ended up passing away from cancer. And after that, at the same time as that, I won a scholarship to go to Canada, the A.E. Brooks Travelling Scholarship, which I won through the University um, of School of Architecture, University of Queensland, which was a great opportunity. And I went to work with um, First Nations Canadian people in the subarctic of Canada in Yellowknife, which was fantastic. This was quickly followed by an interest in starting a master's and a PhD with Paul Mehmet at UQ. And so that's the sequence of events. And it took me five years to do that. Unfortunately for me, again, big life events occurred and I went back home in 2004 because my mother passed away. But this period of time between 2004 and five was um, very intense and a great, shift in a, many things in my life. It was when my mum passed away. I worked for Arup as a program manager, which was great. I also got a diploma of project management in that time, my architectural registration, and I met Michael Clark, who's not the cricketer or a film critic, but he's in fact my husband and he's a carpenter and he's fantastic. And then like many women do who decide to have children, I have a period of about five years in which I had a couple of kids and was working part-time and was trying to maintain a career, which was had some kind of hiatus to it. However, at the end of that time, in 2009, the GFC hit and both my husband and I lost our jobs in a very short period of time. No one had employment. We had a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And I got a phone call from the Northern Territory as an offer to go and work on the Strategic Indigenous Housing and Infrastructure Program. And so we moved. We sold the house and we left and we went and lived back in Darwin. So I'd been in Darwin in 95 and I'd been in Darwin for my PhD and we went back to Darwin again. And I worked on that program for about two years. It was one of the most challenging jobs I've ever done. Um, I had to manage 15 people and against unrealistic timeframes on a program that was really the outcomes were questionable in terms of 
the products for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So it was both ethically challenging and um, useful for, for me from a career perspective. I was the manager of the community engagement and employment workforce development arm for an alliance on that project. We came back home in 2011 and I took a job. Well, I was working for myself, but I also then took a job working for DATSIP, Department of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Partnerships in Cairns on a six month contract to help them implement, implement Indigenous um, home ownership on community, on Doggett land. And that project turned into a two year project with three staff. And I learned a lot from working with DATSIP. It was a great set of experiences and it was very difficult actually to leave. Um, and one of the reasons I decided to leave was to start POD with Belinda Allwood, um, who is my fantastic co-partner in POD. Belinda and I met in 2011, but we didn't start POD until 2014. And in fact, while I was working for DATSIP full-time, she was working for other architects full-time we were doing the Synapse project in our spare time and pod with Indig Design and Pod was building then, even though it wasn't formally a partnership. The rest is kind of history and we will talk through it as we go, but I thought I'd give you this potted snapshot of where I come from and who I am and some of the things that um, I've done and so that you can ask me questions about that in the end. Because I think all of these things, these varying experiences outside of architecture have contributed to me being the person I am and also to creating the kind of architecture that we do. So these, are, this is a map of the various and many places that I have undertaken projects in across Northern Australia. The solid dots are where we're working at the moment or have projects at the moment. Um, although I note the Groot Island dot is incorrect, so we can take, the, oh, there you go, projects 2014 to current. So I'm not working on Groot Island at the moment, but I was in 2015. And the hollow dots are where I've worked prior to 2014. And so there are many places that we've been lucky enough to be and work with people on the ground in those locations. This is um, one of the earliest photos of me working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in architecture. This is taken at Gullawinku in about 1995. And this is really important because this work I undertook with um, Andrew O'Loughlin, who still works for Tropo in Adelaide, who's a tremendous human being. And he and I were sent to Gullawinku together by Tropos to undertake the design of 35 new houses um, as part of the National Aboriginal Health Strategy, um, NAS 1. And when we got there, we realised that English was the fifth language for many people um, at Gullawinku, and we had to use design engagement methodologies that were different from what we would do in mainstream towns to talk to people. So we did a lot of building of models and a lot of flip charts with images of activities on them and a lot of sitting in people's verandas um, talking about design. So this is actually an image of, you can't see it, but it's a two room kind of shed that people were living in with a concrete slab in the middle as a breezeway. During that program, the second version of that was NAS 2, which was in the late nineties. I worked on the, at Gullowinku again with Richard Layton, who was with Tropos at the time. And we did some stuff in social housing that unbeknownst to me would cause a ruckus at the time with the NT government. And this is the best image I've got of this work, which is that what you're seeing there is a forked, a cross pole with a forked post, which is a symbol of um, a fish trap, which is important for the Gulpu people who've been living at Gullawinku in a particular suburban area for four generations. They're not the traditional owners of Gullawinku, but they have a long history of living in that location, as do many different historical owners from Gullawinku. We worked with families to include um, little bits of ownership and specialisation in houses at the time. And afterwards, when housing and NT found out that we had done this, we got into 
we, we got chastised because it was called personalisation of social housing. Now, I'm pretty sure there are probably still Gulpul people who live in that area at Gullawinku and that people haven't um, shifted or been moved in terms of mobility. So this comes back to an argument about this perception that people move around a lot in communities. There is a lot of mobility in remote communities, but there's also a lot of historical ownership of areas where people traditionally lived and camped and continue to occupy generations on. Okay, so the other thing that was going on between 1998 and 2003 was my a lot of research and writing with the Aboriginal Environments Research Centre under the, um, the guidance of Paul Mehmet and the supervision of Paul Mehmet, um, who is a great mentor and friend of mine, who I have a great deal of respect for the quantity of knowledge that he has, which is quite extraordinary. So I'm, he and I, one thing that I'll say for any students listening, one thing I haven't done and I probably should have done is that I didn't publish my PhD as a book. And partly I didn't because of my life circumstances at the time, which were going on, which was a, a range of changes. But if you get the opportunity to do that, you should. But what we have done is I've published probably seven chapters in different books that have come out of the PhD. And each one of those is really important. And the contributions that you make to those large pieces of writing is really important. And the thing about doing a PhD and being an architect is that it gives you a whole other set of skills in critical thinking that you can then apply to your work and methodology around critical thinking. And to study architecture is one thing, but then to do postgraduate research, it gives you a whole other layer of skills that just doing an undergraduate degree doesn't give you. And it's those skills, I think, that make you better all around at your job. Okay, and since then, Belinda and I have only been working together for six years, but there's been a whole lot of other things written and published. And here's a funny slide of us from last year where we laid a few things out on the ground around our publications. Um, and we're proud of those efforts. Um, and in fact, we should probably spend more time, you know, trying to talk about the works that we've written and discussed. But there is the matter of managing a practice with five people in it, and also writing and research, and also, you know, home duties and responsibilities. Okay, one of the things that was really important when I was working in DATSIP and in research and how this contributes to overall understanding and methodologies that can be applied later on to the work that you do was when I worked with DATSIP on the Indigenous Home Ownership Program, I got given a bit of paper that said, can you make 99 year leasing real and how many 99 year leases can you get over the line within a certain period of time, which was 18 months. And that was a request for information from the DG of the department that I was working in at the time. And so what I did was I applied my methods from my PhD. I unpacked the demographics for the area. I unpacked all the land tenure. I had a spreadsheet for every single dog in Queensland that had on it the land tenure, the um, native title constraints, the demographics of the community, the average income based on the ABS statistics. And I, and people's employment, de, you know, employment capacity for employment. And I took that analysis of that spreadsheet back to the DG and I said, you may not like this, but I think maybe, you know, in two years we might get six. He was not very pleased with that information. And then he said, well, why is this so difficult? And so we sort of sat down and I said to him, these are all of the land tenure and legislative constraints in addition to social and demographic constraints and poverty that are placed over people and why the idea of um, independent home ownership is very difficult to achieve under the current set of conditions. So, which he understood. Um, there is still a 99 year residential leasing program in Queensland and I think probably nationally. What I can say to you though, is that for some places, this is Luella Bly and her granddaughter, and this is on Palm Island, this photograph, 
Luella Bly was the first person in Queensland to get a 99-year residential lease over her property on Palm Island, which overlooks the beach and is magnificent. And I helped her get it. And I helped her get... There were two other people on Palm Island and there are three people at Yarrabah who have 99-year residential leases on their properties, which means that those properties cannot be taken away by someone else. They can't be moved out of their homes. And if they want to sell them to other people within the community that the land trust agrees to, that, that that can happen. And so I guess that's a piece of work I'm pretty proud of contextually. And it also means I have a pretty good understanding in principle, I'm not a lawyer, but of land tenure constraints in Queensland Indigenous communities. The other work that I did at the same time, which was through AERC, was around um, conditionality and tenancy on Palm Island and also with housing and homelessness. And this was with the Aboriginal Environments Research Centre through Uhuri Grants and with the Department of Housing and Public Works. And those experience of undertaking being a case study um, leader through the AERC were very um, important to me in the maintaining the skills I had developed during the PhD, as well as contributing to how I think about architecture and the practice that we do. Okay, so let's talk about POD. We're at 2014. This is, it is a multidisciplinary practice. Um, I've decided that living in a region, it's better to have a multidisciplinary practice because it means that we are more sustainable from a business perspective. If we specialise too much, I think that we would be less sustainable as a business. And the team consists of five people at the moment, myself, Belinda, Ellen Buttrose, who's been with us for nearly three years, Michael Shannon, who's a graduate from Griffith, who's great, and Karen Lawson, who helps us with um, office management. This is the current breakup of the work. It's kind of 50% architecture and 50% everything else. I have shown this slide previously in the Art of Living last year and the landscape comp component, which was green, was much smaller, probably only 15%. The landscape component for POD has grown substantially over the last six months. And that's due to Belinda going and getting a master's in landscape design and it's going really well. So I'm really pleased about that because it gives us more diversity and a surety. CE stands for community engagement, if you're wondering what that is. Um, PM stands for project management and research is self-explanatory. So one of the things quickly I wanna mention as part of the diversity of the practice to do with the residential work we do is that it's anchored around this principle of the least house necessary, which was an idea I came up with um, as a result of giving a, International Women's Day talk in 2010. And it came from frustration of living in a very large rambling house, which I still live in, and having come from a very small, efficient house that I'd made for myself, um, which was only 90 square metres, which I had to give up to go to Darwin. And I kept ranting to my husband saying, I really need the least house necessary. I don't have time to maintain the thing that we're living in. And so this launched this idea around a design philosophy and manifesto about having the least house necessary in the tropics, which is a house that interacts really well with the natural environment externally and a house which also um, is enough and not too much. Now, I want to acknowledge that this photo is from a workshop we did in Canberra a couple of years ago, and that Sarah Lebner took this photo. So every year we do one or two workshops about the least house necessary. So it's not only a design philosophy, it's an educational workshop. It's like Design 101. It's fun. It's very hands-on. And we get the general public moving from a design brief through to spatial planning and thinking about um, what they need to live comfortably with in the in the climatic environment they're working in. So at the moment we have um, completed three leased houses in Cairns and we've got two more under in documentation at the moment. We had an additional three in concept which COVID put on hold, but you'll be glad to hear two of those clients have rung back in the last week due to um, the home builder program 
love it or hate it, it's um, helping bring back the least house necessary. And so this is the one that we've most recently finished that I don't have external shots of yet, which is a house at Trinity Beach in Cairns, which Ellen and I mainly designed together. It has an 8.2 star energy rating. It came in for 440, including the pool and GST, which we're pretty proud of. And you can see the fully enclosed areas and the unenclosed areas there. So hopefully you'll see more photos of our latest lease house necessary when we get out there with a professional photographer soon. Great client on this one. The thing about the leased house is that you end up working with clients who are really aligned with you on it. And so you can work together to make um, a great outcome. Sorry about the phone ringing in the background, if you can hear it. Okay, the other thing, one of the first projects that launched POD is the Synapse Warner Street project, um, which Belinda and I started working together with Andrew and Francois Lane of Indige Design and Jenny Lynch and um, Guja Guja Formal of Agriculture back in 2011. This project is a supported accommodation for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with complex disabilities. And it was spearheaded by Jennifer Cullen, who's the CEO of Synapse, who's an incredible waka waka woman and um, a fabulous mentor and with great passion for people with acquired brain injury. And she came to us asking us to make a place. And when I say us, I mean us collectively. She came to us asking us to make a place for people for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that was not institutional, that connected to um, the natural environment, that was enabled a model of healthcare that was progressive and aligned with what Synapse was trying to do. So these are some, this won the FNQ Regional Project of the Year Award in 2019 or 18, and here's the, general site plan and the floor plan of the duplexes. This project has a really long history and the Institute of Architects has a recorded webinar that talks about this project in more detail. So if you've seen that webinar, you will have heard about Synapse Warner Street before. It had two lives. It had a life on a bigger site, which then got curtailed and knocked back due to 80 objections and racist nimbyism from a, project, a site near Gordonvale. Then we got a new site in Cairns and were asked to maintain the capital budget from 2011 and re-master plan the project but not redesign it and put it on the new site, which we did together. And some of the siting that you can see, Andrew Lane and I did that together, the site master planning. Belinda helped crack really the form of the buildings. We which we had a traditional owner reference group um, from the area who we would meet with on a regular basis who contributed to both the design at a, at a form and spatial layout level, as well as from um, a materiality and colour level and also from a landscape perspective. So there was a lot of um, intercultural engagement on this project. And it was complex from a political perspective and from a cost perspective, and it was a big group of people to manage. But in the end, the result is really good. I know I don't have any photos to show you of people because we can't take photos of people at the facility while they're in it. But I can tell you that the people who are living there, have been there for two years or more now, um, really enjoy living at Synapse. And probably something that's really important to no, um, Griffith University have undertaken a post-occupancy evaluation of this um, social and emotional well-being as a result of people being in this facility. And people, the people who are in it had come from other institutions on high levels of medical control. So they were on drugs to keep their behaviour under control. And now most of those people um, are off those medical controls and are actively working on their brain injury and their neuroplasticity and their independence. And so the holistic benefits of shifting out of an institutional model of care into one which supported Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural practices and ways of being is um, demonstrated through that 
research that Griffith's done. Okay, I'll keep moving. Um, this is another project that we worked on in collaboration, again, with, in this instance, with Kramer Asenko and specifically Charmaine Alautale and Angela Morton, who are both um, Indigenous women from different places, and Indy Sivakuma, um, who's from the Pacific. And this is in New South Wales. This was an ACAP project with a very tight time frame um, and a complex set of stakeholders again, which included Army as the lead. Toomla was a bigger project that included civil works and roads and safety and other things in the community. But we worked on the multi-purpose hall, which was the replacement of an existing hall that was derelict on the site, adjacent to the existing church to create a new place for land council officers and agency officers and a hall that would act as both a sports hall, a community hall, a music hall, a gathering place for funerals, all sorts of things. The most important part of this project was um, the site in the sense that there's an existing courtyard between the church and the hall which needed to be maintained because it was a very significant gathering place and it overviewed it looked towards the cemetery and also um, a series of significant places that we had to honour. And so the placement and organisation of this building on the site has been very carefully undertaken so that there is a veranda that looks over the courtyard and interacts with the courtyard and also that that faces um, away from the northern sun and it's in the shade and it's in the breeze and it captures the southerlies. The engagement process for this project was only three to four visits, but it was really well organised and we set it up so that every time we went, we had at least 40 people attend those meetings. And you can see me in the middle of the top photo there sitting on the ground. So I could give you a whole other talk about um, the way I undertake community engagement with places I've never been to before. And a lot of it is about... Um, getting down and making myself even smaller than I am and, and being open and getting on the ground. So that is a quick summary of the Tumula project, which we haven't really talked about very much because the, um, the and there's a lovely photo of it that Belinda took with a drone, which she has a license to use um, and which the photos we've given back to the community. The Tumla project, there are, um, I guess, constraints from the Australian government about the information that we share across with everyone, but we have permission to share these images and the community gets in touch with us on a fairly regular basis every six months and we check in to see how they're going. And they call it, um, whether this is a good thing or not, I'm not sure, but they call it colloquially their opera house and they enjoy using it um, for the activities that they undertake in it. Okay, so this is a project which is pretty much finished, but we haven't been able to get up to open it, which is the Torres Strait Regional Authorities Land and Sea Unit on Thursday Island. And it is a commercial building um, on a very important corner, on the corner of Douglas and Hastings Street on Thursday Island. And it's, um, it is, this is what COVID-19 did. It was about a week off practical completion. The only thing left to do was the commissioning and testing of the um, mechanical systems. And that couldn't be undertaken because of travel restrictions. And so the contract is, is currently suspended until we can get up there. Well, not me specifically, but others can get up there to finish it, which I think is happening at the moment. So we're hoping this building will open in July. Important things to say about this, this is another collaboration with Francois Lane of Indige Design in which she has undertaken a lot of, um, there's a lot of her built-in art in the project and surface pattern designs. And so you can see two of those things at the moment in these images. One is um, about, I think we say nudibranchs, those little tiny, beautiful sea slug things that are magnificent under the ocean and also glam clams, which is the um, pattern of the blue and navy in the other um, image. Fran's work on glam, glam clams also occurs on the outside screen of this building, which we went through a process of um, permissions through TSRA um, to have that work included as Fran 
is from both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander descent and has connections back to, very strong connections back to Hammond Island. Um, so it was a pleasure to work with her on that project. This project, I'm rushing a bit today because I'm running out of time, but it's important to know that the inspiration for this project in terms of form and placement and scale and community benefit is it does reference back to pearl luggers and sails and dharis in its very strong white forms and its awnings and its kind of filigree of blue underneath the awnings. So if anyone knows what a Torres Strait Islander headdress looks like, which is called a dari, it has all of these incredible elements to it. But the other really important thing to know about the whiteness of this building is that it will be a platform for projected Torres Strait Islander art. And so there's a separate project, which is about projection art that is being set up by TSRA at the moment, whereby um, there will be ability to project onto this building um, so that it becomes really a canvas for Torres Strait art of Thursday Island and the region, which is going to be fabulous when that happens. And I can't wait to see the building covered in um, illuminations. It'll be great. So that's one to look forward to. This is one that we are working on um, right now. Um, that, in fact, is going to tender today and I have stopped the tender panic to come and speak to you in the middle of it. So this is some um, Department of Health project and it's for Girini Yalamaka um, Aboriginal Health Service in Yarrabah. And it has been a pleasure to work on. Um, it's a project which is a health and wellbeing centre, so a subsidiary to the main primary health clinic, but it will contain some mainly counselling spaces and supportive spaces for allied health. We've done this project in collaboration with Coburn Architecture, who are a local um, Cairns business also run by um, women and has a female directorship of Elena Coburn. And it's been fantastic to work with them because they have so much knowledge in and around health projects and more commercial projects. And we've learned a lot through the process and I'm hoping that they feel like they've learned things as well. Anyway, it's been great to work on. And one of the things I wanted to say about this project is that it's been really informed by the site and working with local community. And that's been a pleasure. So the landscape plan that you can see behind where the building's sitting is there's a few things going on here. The existing site is at the back of a sand dune and so it drains away from the, sea, the street to the back of the site, which creates a sort of um, natural uh, stormwater drain kind of lagoon area that runs across Yarrabah behind this sand dune, behind many sites, and this is one of them. And so rather than trying to, um, what, we, what we're trying to do in this project and will do is that we're celebrating that natural um, distribution of water across the site and we're creating a um, landscape solution which includes a dry and wet creek bed at different times of the year and also brings and recognises this place as a place of living water, which is what we've been told about. So that's really important. So there are a number of themes in this building, themes about Girini Yelamaka, which means good healing, themes about living water, and in our engagement with um, traditional owners, um, Gunganji people from Yarrabah, we had, have had um, one long meeting with them and secondary discussions because of COVID through other mentors. Their advice was that they wanted to Yarrabanize, I'll use that word, I thought it's great. They said, we want to Yarrabanize the building by including Guila in it, who is the Seahawk or Brahmani kite. And so we're in a process of um, working with the Yarraba Arts Centre at the moment, which has just started, where we're going to include a range of built in art into the project that begins to celebrate living water, healing water, which are two separate things, and Guila, the Seahawk. So this project is one to look out for. Um, yeah, and hopefully will be built by the middle of next year if we don't get another COVID outbreak. There's a whole range of complexities with working remotely that I haven't spoken about to do with biosecurity permits and what work you can and can't do and when you can get in and out. But I'm hoping that 
when the third stage of restrictions ease in Queensland, that contract, which will happen soon, that our contractors will be able to get in and start this project. Okay. All right, quickly, intercultural design. This term, I guess, has been around for a little while, and I think I was one of the people who helped anchor it within architecture. It, people can call design practice co-design or um, cross-cultural design. In this instance, I call it intercultural design because it's about bringing people's cultural perceptions to the, to the fore um, and how you see the world and sharing those perceptions so that you can kind of come to a common ground together on understanding each other's positions. I need to say how lucky I am to have such a great set of mentors and friends and guides around me who include some of the people in this slide. Gujja Gujja Formal, Uncle Peter Hyde, Aunty Marilyn Wallace, Uncle Peter Wallace, and other people who are not in the slide, like Jamin Wilcox, you know, there's Andrew Lane, Francois Lane. We have so many people who are so generous with their time to work with us in this space. And that's what makes the space rich and be able to move forward through people's generosity and um, our ability to listen to each other and respect one another in the process. And through that comes ag um, advocacy and agency. So the other part of what I wanted to mention today is that I'm obviously an adjunct associate professor at UQ, which I really enjoy um, contributing to that. And the recent teaching and advocacy that we've been doing through that role is part of the social outreach studios at UQ, which we helped coordinate in 2017 and 18 with different Aboriginal land trusts in far North Queensland. And we took 16 or so students to each of those to work with people. Now, I will note quite funny in those two slides that um, Maya McKenna and Alex Hewitt are in both of those slides accidentally, um, but they were lucky enough to come on both of the social outreach studios and I hope that informs and influences the work that they do in the future. Um, part of that, this slide demonstration is also a trip that I took to Pakistan last year through the generosity of the Prince's Trust of Australia and Interbau, the International Network of Traditional Building Architecture and Urbanism. And these, that was an incredible four day trip, but I got to meet Yasmin Lari and be at a conference listening to and experiencing the work that she's doing in Pakistan, um, which was very inspirational. Now, why are these things together on the screen? Because um, UQ and Princess Truss are working together at the moment in trying to develop up an enduring masterclass, uh, which I'm very pleased to be the ambassador of. Um, and you'll hear more about that, no doubt, in the coming few months. Um, but it's been a pleasure to be able to work closely with UQ and the Princess Trust on enabling um, education around intercultural design and, um, yeah, youth education in that area. So thank you to both organisations for that. Okay, POD, these are our core values. Just to wrap up, we try to see things with a fresh perspective and do things differently to norm, to, you know, to the norm in management, planning and design. We value people. That's probably pretty obvious to anyone watching now, we place value on relationships and building productive and innovative teams and projects. We are a bit painful. We like to get stuff right. We go through a series of continuous holistic and detailed thinking through all stages of the project. I wouldn't call myself a perfectionist, but um, Belinda is more of a perfectionist than I am. And together, it means that the quality of the work going out the door is, is high. Um, we embrace sustainability in everything, in the designing and delivering of sustainable built environments and incorporating sustainable practices in our daily business operations. And we have Ellen, who's on the sustainability committee for the Institute for Queensland. And we really do try and interrogate as best we can sustainable opportunities from an environmental, social and economic um, perspective on all the projects that we're working on. I think you will probably be able to link together adventure, adaptability, independence, 
improvisation and sufficiency across this talk. Um, without adventure, I don't think I would be in architecture because the day-to-day -day grind of documentation is something that I find a bit brain numbing, probably like most people. And so it's through the diversity of architecture that I've found adventure to keep that part of me happy. Um, we pod is infinitely adaptable. We've done a pretty much every type of project you can think of, except for retail really, which I think Ellen has some experience in, but every other typology we've had a crack at. We value our independence and our independent voice. And one of the things I realized when I was working for large organizations and institutions was that I wasn't very good at having my voice um, stymied. And that sounds a bit arrogant, um, but I, one of the reasons we set up POD was to have that level of independent voice, which we really value. Um, the improvisation and sufficiency components come from, I think, living and growing up on a farm with um, a father who would make things from nothing, particularly from a mechanical perspective. Um, and so we apply that level of improvisation and sufficiency to the projects that we work on. Okay, so this is my last slide before question time. I want to thank, this is a slide of a whole lot of really important people who've influenced me um, in the last 20 years of my life or so. And they're probably people who aren't on that slide who should be, which is why it says you. And if you're out there and you're listening, you know who you are. But without these people in my life behind me and beside me, then I would not have been able to do half the things that I've done. And I'm incredibly grateful for that, including to my dog, whose name is Indy. So thank you very much. I am going to stop sharing now so that we can have a little question time. Okay. Thanks, Janine. That was absolutely terrific. Thank you. Um, we've already got some questions coming up in the panel, um, in the Q&A, but I, I want to kick it off by asking you one quick question. Um, who inspired you when you were in high school to study architecture? How did you, how did you make that leap? You missed that bit out of the story. Uh, it was, in fact, my art teacher. So I was... Oh, it's a long story. I was a bit of a rebellious nerd and I ended up in a private school for year 11 and 12 because I'd been naughty in year 8 to 10. And I continued to do art as well as straight maths and science. And my art teacher, I said to my, I really love biology and physics, but my art teacher, Mr Ray, said to me, why don't you do architecture? That kind of brings all of that stuff together, physics, art. And I went, oh, okay. You know, I come from a farming family. No, really, no one ever talked about architecture. People made stuff all the time. Hmm. Not particularly beautiful stuff necessarily, but certainly things that worked. Um, so I would put it down to Mr. Ray, from art, who was my art teacher, who suggested I go in that direction. So thanks to him. And having made that decision, what was the first week of the first year, first semester like here at UQ? Oh, have you and I had this conversation before? No. <laughs> it was um, I. It was fantastic. So I also had put down vet science as a first preference, but didn't get in. That's in and interestingly, Belinda and I had both put down vet science, but didn't get in. But my first week in architecture was a letter from vet science saying we've got a space for you if you want it, and going to lectures by. Um, Max Horner, where we had to make paper headdresses or paper things for our heads. And I came from this, you know, regional family in far north Queensland, not particularly conservative, but I remember walking in and Max had come back from Sydney and he was wearing a black trench coat and he had a mohawk in a colour on his head. And he started talking to us about design and it blew my mind. And then we were making these paper headdresses. And I remember having this conversation with my parents. They're saying, oh, how are you, what are you learning about architecture? And I thought to myself, I'm not telling them because they'll, they'll think it's not working. And I'll say, it's fantastic. I'm learning all sorts of things and I'm 
yeah, I'm not going to accept the vet science offer, so I'm staying where I am. There you go. We're all very glad you did. <laughs> uh, there's a question um, that asks you, what advice you would give for architecture students and graduates who are just starting out on their careers? I would say, actually, here, I've got some notes here. Um, I think having a diversity of work experiences will really improve the work that you do. I think that it's good to step out of architecture for a bit and go and do other things because when, if you come back to architecture and hopefully you will, because it's an incredible problem solving profession that you will then be able to apply the other experiences you've had. So don't be afraid to go and do something else for, an, for a couple of years. Just try and remember what you enjoy about architecture. Try not to, if you're in the middle of doing toilet details on a very large commercial building because you're in fourth year, try not to get lost in that. So someone's just asked, how do you keep going given the real grind of running a small business? Okay. Uh, no, the questions are all hard today, Shanine. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's easy. There's two answers to that. They're called Michael and Belinda. There you go. <laughs> so you'll need to unpack that slightly. Yeah, yeah. So Michael is my partner who um, is a carpenter and who is a great grassroots human being and a very gentle human being. And he is quite happy to do 50% um, of the equity in terms of sweat equity at home. And without him, I couldn't do what I do. And Belinda is my business partner in POD. And she, it's much easier to run a business when you can share the, 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 um, the load with someone else. And so it was, it's through the support of others that you can then share the load. And like, for example, Belinda's on leave now for a week, um, which is great. So she can go away for a week and know that everything's gonna be fine. And, and I will do the same later in a year. So together, it's about um, that. I guess um, the grind of running, it's things like this that make it more fun. I think Cameron rang me in the middle of COVID and we had a good chat and he said, do you want to give a talk? And I said, yeah, go on. It'll give me something else to look forward to that's outside the daily grind of the business. So it is about those extracurricular activities. So even though they take time and effort, and I may have only slept five hours in the last couple of nights, it means that you get to do something that's a bit different and a bit fun. Great. So, Shanine, we should probably get you, let you get back to getting that tender out. Um, it's absolutely brilliant you've been able to join us today. This, this series has enabled us to connect with a whole range of different alum. Can I say one more thing that I'd written right. down? Well, yeah, it's your say. Is that all right? Okay. It's not very long. I was just thinking of, it's a bit of a generalist statement, but I think it's important. So post pandemic, I've been yeah. thinking about this lately. I think um, pre pandemic, there's always been this talk about architecture as a vulnerable profession and it, us being eroded by so many others at the moment or previous to pandemic. I think post pandemic, we're in this really opportune moment where people can see the benefit of designers and architects in the remaking of our cities and places. Um, and that I think we need to harness it as best we can. And so that we don't rebuild exactly what we had before that we rebuild something different. And so I see it as a kind of mini potential renaissance for architects and designers at the moment, where we could be more valued than we were before. There you go. That was what I wanted to say. I think that's a brilliant sentiment and um, a challenge to the profession and a challenge to our students right now to think about how to reimagine what the profession is. And I think um, pre-COVID, we were seeing signs of it. And I think I absolutely agree with you, Shanine. It's about how, how that post-COVID renaissance is embraced and how we use those opportunities that come from change and from, from quick moments of, of sudden change that create opportunities that, that architects are very well placed to fill because of the way they think. Yep, exactly. Yep. Sorry to interrupt you, Cameron, before. Well, I think it was 
uh, it was a delightful interruption, Janine. And I, I do want to acknowledge in closing that all the great work you do um, for us in your adjunct capacity. Um, we really appreciate everything you do for the school. And I think today is a, is a further reminder of that, that connection and of that, that great ongoing conversation and deep friendship. So thank you very much, Shanine. Thank you, Cameron. And thank you to everyone listening. Thank you for joining in. I hope you enjoyed it. I know it was um, a potted history of Fanton, but um, if you want more on the intercultural one, the Institute has a copy of that somewhere, I think, that they've been playing. All right. Brilliant. Thanks, Shanine. Thank you. So, don't go yet. This was the oh. fourth in the series. Yep. Um, that we're delivering over the coming months. And they've all been fantastic talks and, and really diverse in terms of mapping the trajectory of um, graduates from the School of Architecture. The next event will be presented by Julia Watson, a designer, activist and academic. And that will be on the 18th of June at 9 a.m. So um, thank you everyone for attending today and we hope to see you all at the next session. And thank you again to Shanine, a big round of applause for her. Thanks, Janine. Thanks, Cameron. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon.